Many observers have compared the current financial turmoil with other major crises the world has seen. James Boughton, the IMF's historian, puts the crisis in historical perspective. The United States, for example, has seen three previous pretty major crises in the post-war period. The dollar was forced off gold in the late 1960s so that the dollar was no longer backed by, uh, by a hard asset. Ten years later, in the late 70s, very high inflation led to a very uh, severe attack on the dollar. And the United States was uh, forced to draw on its reserves at the IMF, for example. It didn't actually have to ask for a standby arrangement, but if it had gotten much worse, they might have been. So that was a very serious crisis. And then in the late 1980s, the, uh, the savings and loan industry, the thrift industry in the United States, uh, virtually disappeared in the saving, what was then called the savings and loan crisis. It was very expensive, and it could have been even more severe. So each time there's been the potential that you could have a financial and even an economic collapse in the country. But it didn't happen. We got through it. Experts say that financial globalization makes the current crisis different than any the world has previously seen because the interlinkages among financial institutions are much greater today than in the past. This started as a crisis in low-quality mortgage loans, home loans to people who would have trouble repaying them in the United States. But it then spiraled out of control because the institutions that were making those mortgage loans were dependent on other institutions for the money that they were using to lend. And those institutions were depending on other institutions. And so very quickly, this spiraled into, an, into a crisis that was affecting financial institutions everywhere. And that wasn't true 10 or 20 years ago, but it is true now, and it's something we need to be very cautious about. Some say that we are witnessing the disintegration of the financial system or the end of laissez-faire capitalism. Will the balance tip toward greater regulation? There's been a debate for quite a while between people who think that markets are perfect and if you just leave them alone, get the government out of the way, everything will work great. And on the other side, you have people who think that markets are rife with greed and corruption and, and we need to have very tight oversight and regulation. And certainly a crisis like this tips the balance of that argument toward that second view. But we don't need to go to these extremes, and I don't think we will go to these extremes. I think the fact is that what we need to reach is a point where we can strike the right balance between letting markets work, getting the good effects of, of free markets, and having proper oversight and regulation of those markets so that they don't get out of control and so that you don't get too much concentration of power, too much opportunity for greed in markets. Financial crises in recent memory have largely affected emerging market economies rather than advanced economies. But the current crisis is far from the only one the United States and other major economies have faced in recent decades. Certainly in the, in the post-war period, the closest we've seen to a crisis like this in the advanced economies was the collapse of the fixed exchange rate system in 1973. You know, there was a period when American tourists in Europe were finding that, that no one wanted to take their dollars. They couldn't spend their dollars in shops or, or restaurants because no one knew what the dollar was going to be worth the next day. So that was a major crisis, and, and that's just one example of, of how serious a problem that was at the time. And it was a problem that affected all the major countries. Since that time, a number of other countries have also suffered crises. Not exactly financial crises, but serious economic predicaments. In the late 70s, uh, both Italy and the United Kingdom had standby arrangements with the IMF because their economies were suffering greatly under the, uh, the shock of high oil prices and floating exchange rates. That was the last major lending that the IMF did to major industrial countries. That was in 1977 and 1978, 30 years ago. But after that, 
Um, in Japan, we had a major crisis where the, there was a bubble in real estate prices, and when that collapsed, you had stagnation in Japan for a decade. So we've seen some major crises, but again, what makes this one difference is the way it affects all of these major countries, and it's, it's a much more pervasive crisis and has more serious economic uh, potential for a crisis than, than what we had seen before. Just how big is the current crisis? People have been saying for the last few weeks that this is the biggest financial crisis since the 1930s. I, th I think it's important to remember, though, the 1930s was a horrendous decade in which uh, market activity virtually collapsed for several years. Uh, output fell very sharply. Unemployment in the United States was 25 percent. And the economies around the world did not recover for a whole decade. Now we're a long way from that point right now. But we could get to that point if we're not careful. Despite the gravity of the crisis, Boughton believes that, with the right policies, we can avert a crisis of Depression-era proportions. To my mind, what we're seeing right now looks like a very slow train wreck. <laughs> you know, the, if, when a train starts to go off the rails, it can take a little time before the, it actually tips over. And right now we're at a point where, on one side, the wheels of the train have come off the track and it's tilting quite a bit. But if you react properly in that, we still have enough forward momentum that we can still try to get the train to right itself and get back on the track without it turning into a total disaster.